Welcome everyone. Um, we are now in our third and final lecture of week three on the early modern, early modern English plague. Okay, and we're going to uh, talk about some poems by Ben Johnson today. And I'm just going to do a little screen share here so that you can see my PowerPoint. Um, is that the right one? It should be. Yes, there we go. I'll back that up to the beginning. And yes, let me see if I can get that on. That is on full screen. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some poems by Ben Johnson today. And uh, Ben Johnson, who is Ben Johnson, uh, his dates are 1572 to 1637. And he was an English playwright and poet. He is generally considered a one of the most important playwrights in the English Renaissance and is often evaluated as second only to Shakespeare. He was also famous as a poet and was highly influential in poetry circles during his lifetime. So many younger poets who were influenced by him called themselves the sons of Ben, or they, uh, uh, they described themselves as being part of his tribe. Okay, so uh, Ben Johnson is famous for his collection of over 100 epigrams. And uh, they were published in 1616, but they were written over the course of many years. And we're going to look at just a few of those epigrams, particularly we're going to look at several of his elegiac epigrams. So there are three E words you need to know before we go on to discuss some of Johnson's poetry. Epigram, elegy, and epitaph. An epigram is a pithy saying or remark expressing an idea in a clever and amusing way. And poetic epigrams, that is epigrams that are poems, uh, are generally brief, witty, incisive verses that often take a surprise turn at the end. And uh, some of uh, Johnson's epigrams are they're short and sharp and satirical uh, and they're invectives. Well, in fact, they're all short. Um, that's kind of goes along with being an epigram. And uh, some of them are so some of them are satirical and sharp and some of them are compliments paid to friends and patrons or memorials uh, to the dead. Our second E word elegy is a poetic lament for the dead. So it's a it's a type of poem or it's a type of lament. And it's a, a meditative, mournful, and commemorative poem. And it's usually, it's all, almost always <laughs> written about a death or a tragic occurrence. Elegies tend to lament the ephemerality of life, but they also at least try to achieve some kind of consolation, to consider cons uh, consolations for the loss, whether those consolations are spiritual or of some other sort. An epitaph is a phrase or a short piece of writing uh, written in memory of a person who has died. And an, an, an epitaph is what you will often see inscribed on a tombstone and it makes a statement about the deceased person. The main poem that we're going to examine in this lecture is uh, Johnson's epigram 45, On My First Son, and it was probably written in 1603. And uh, this epigram on my first son is all of these things. It is an epigram, an elegy, and a kind of epitaph. We're also going to examine more briefly Johnson's epigram for his daughter who died at six months old. Uh, we're going to look at his epigram of death, and we're going to look at two epigrams about the death of his close friend, John Rowe. So Ben Johnson's son, Benjamin Jr., died of plague in 1603 at the age of seven. And at the time Johnson was out of London, he was in the countryside and uh, he was at 
Sir Robert Cotton's place at, at his country home. And he was there with, uh, with Sir Robert Cotton and also with his old schoolmaster and mentor, William Camden. Uh, we're not entirely sure why Johnson was away at this time. Um, it's possible that he was getting away from the plague, although the, the plague was only just beginning when he left London. It's most likely that he was pursuing a patronage opportunity. Johnson was guilty of uh, neglecting his, his marriage and his family while he developed his career. And it's quite likely that he was pursuing a career opportunity when he was away that summer. It is also quite possible that he was estranged from his wife as it is, it is known, there's not a lot known about his marriage, but it, it does not seem to have been a happy marriage. So arguably, uh, Johnson neglected his patriarchal duties by being away at this time. Um, it was considered the head of the household's obligation to look after uh, his family and household during plague times, during all times, and particularly during difficult times. And uh, Johnson's home parish in London, which was uh, St. Giles Cripplegate, it was in fact one of the hardest hit uh, parishes during the plague. It, it had nearly 3,000 plague deaths in a population of less than 5,000. So that's a lot. Now, it's also highly likely that Johnson missed his son's burial as well because, because his son died of plague, he would have been buried quite quickly afterwards. So this, um, this poem, this epigram 45 on my first son, um, it's addressed to young Benjamin and uh, it's, it's a poem saying goodbye to him. And, and you see that in the first line of, of the poem, which says, farewell thou child of my right hand and joy. And the poem can be seen as a kind of compensatory burial ritual. Um, that is, Johnson wrote the poem as a way to enact a burial ritual as compensation for the one that he missed, for his compensation for missing the burial of his son. It's quite possible, probably even, that uh, young Ben was buried in one of those uh, common plague pits, those unmarked common plague pits. So Johnson's poem, in that sense, would also act as a kind of individualizing, immortalizing uh, inscription, you know, a kind of something that makes his burial unique to him, to, to the son you know, who, who didn't actually get that kind of personalized treatment in his, in his actual burial. So, so basically this epigram can be seen as a poetic substitute for the burial that Johnson missed and for the type of burial that young, uh, young Ben may not have received. And we see this in, especially in line nine of the poem, which uh, addressing his son, the poet tells him, rest in soft peace and asked say, here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. So rest in soft peace is a modified form of rest in peace, which is uh, what a priest would say at a burial service. And here doth lie is the English translation of the Latin uh, hic jacet, which appears as part of the epitaph on, um, on a tombstone, particularly during this time. So the poem essentially it, the, the first eight and a half lines or so are a kind of elegiac lament over the death of the boy um, and, and that, you know, as it would occur at a funeral. And then at the end, we have this formal epitaph, a kind of formal epitaph that would be inscribed on a gravestone. So it has that kind of movement from elegiac lament to epitaph. Um, 
Yeah, seven-year-old Ben was not the only child uh, Johnson lost. As I've mentioned earlier, his daughter, Mary Johnson, probably his firstborn child, died in November of 1593 at the age of six months. And four years after seven-year-old Ben died, um, another son was born who was also named Ben, and, but that second Ben Jr. died in 1611 at age three. So it is perhaps significant that, uh, you know, Ben Johnson, he, he lost all these children and many of his significant relationships in his life were modeled on a kind of on a father son relationship. You know, on that relationship that he was, you know, not able to fulfill with young Ben, with both young Ben's. He had uh, intense bonds with other men um, who were either father figures to him, like his tutor and mentor, William Camden, or to whom he was a father figure. He was a mentor to many younger poets who admired his poetry, mimicked his style, and followed his philosophy. And as I mentioned earlier, those younger poets were known as the sons of Ben. And one of those younger poets was a man named John Rowe, with whom Johnson had a close relationship and about whom Johnson wrote two epigrams. Johnson's ongoing grief is known to us uh, partly because of the accounts of a man named William Drummond, uh, who was a poet, and uh, Johnson visited him in Scotland in 1618. And Drummond recorded, that is, he wrote down um, many of the details of the conversations they had, and then he later published them. And according to Drummond, Johnson spoke quite passionately about both the death of his seven-year-old son and about the death of his younger friend, uh, John Rowe, who died two years after uh, seven-year-old Ben Jr. Uh, and no, this was a long time afterwards. I mean, this was 1618. So that he spoke of these deaths so passionately so many years later suggests, uh, tells us something about the depth of Johnson's grief. According to the story that um, Johnson told William Drummond, Johnson had an uncanny premonition of his son's death before it happened. Apparently, the night before he got the news, he dreamt that his son appeared to him no longer a child, but a grown man uh, with a bloody cross on his forehead. So etched into his forehead. And so that would be a cross like the ones that were painted on doors in quarantined houses during the plague. It, only this was a, a cross that was cut into uh, Ben Jr.'s skin. When he woke up, Johnson apparently went to the bedchamber of his mentor, William Camden, and told him about the dream. And, you know, obviously he was upset. And Camden told him that it was a fantasy. He shouldn't pay attention to it. It's a product of his mind, and, and it was nothing to be concerned about. But then that same day, uh, later that day, letters came from Johnson's wife with the bad news of the young boy's death in the plague. So it's hard to know what to make of this story. Um, I do think we can be assured that Johnson told the story to Drummond, um, but of course, we'll never know what Johnson actually experienced. Um, if Johnson truly experienced the prophetic dream as he described it, if he did have that dream, as he described it, it suggests that he probably felt anxious and guilty about leaving his son behind in London, knowing you know, that he was vulnerable to plague there. He would have heard reports that plague was bad. If he didn't have the dream, which is also possible, but he believed he had that dream, then you know, if he manifested the memory of this dream vision, memory is so um, hard to pin down and subjective, 
um, that certainly tells us something about the trauma that Johnson carried with him after his son's death. What also strikes me about this dream, about this vision, uh, is the, the, the bloody red cross that Johnson sees on his son's forehead. It's a striking visual emblem of the plague. And it's, it's a symbol of the plague that of course Johnson would have been very familiar with because he would have seen it on doorways of quarantined homes in London. Um, and so it reinforces for us how powerful and prevalent that painted red cross on doorways must have been, that how impressed upon the psyches of the people of London it must have been. Now, the other story that Johnson told Drummer, Drummond, excuse me, that seems particularly relevant um, is the story of John Rowe's death. Two years after Benjamin Jr. died, John Rowe also died, um, uh, and uh, also of the plague or the pest, as um, Johnson called it. As Johnson tells the story, he, Johnson, nursed John Rowe through his illness and held him in his arms when he died. And then he went to great length and expense to ensure that John Rowe had a proper and suitable burial. Now, it seems like a simple story, but that story was an important one. Um, I mean, I, I think the fact that that story was an important one to Johnson tells us something about his response to his son's death from plague. I think we can see Roe as a kind of second Benjamin, a second son who dies of plague. Um, but, you know, yeah, so I, I think we can see, I, I think we can see a kind of repetition here that, that um, Johnson sees John uh, Rowe as a kind of second son and treats him as such. So, I mean, let's think about the implications of that. Um, you know, on the one hand, John Rowe's death would certainly confirm to Johnson that Johnson is, is powerful, powerless to protect those that he loves from plague. But on the other hand, I think that Rose death seems to have offered Johnson an opportunity to redo his son's death only differently. So he, he failed to be there for his seven-year-old son, but he didn't fail to be there for this surrogate son. And he, you know, he shares the suffering of his friend. He courageously stays with him. He witnesses his pain. He shows his loyalty and his love to his friend, and he behaves with a selflessness that he, he did not demonstrate towards his family. He was not there when for Benjamin's illness and death. And then he arranged that John go, excuse me, John Rowe get a proper burial, even though his own financial means were certainly limited. And, and, and thus by doing so, in some ways, he made up for the burial of his own son. Okay, let's move on to the epigram on my first son. And I'm going to read the poem first off. Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay exacted by thy fate on the just day. Oh, could I lose all father now? For why will man lament the state he should envy? To have so soon scaped worlds and flesh's rage, and if no other misery yet age. Rest in soft peace and asked, say, here doth lie. Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. For whose sake henceforth all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. I think one of the things that is most striking about this poem is its restraint. 
it's, it's grave and understated tone. Johnson's poetry is known for its plain style. Um, he, he uses simple language and his poems have neoclassical grace and clarity. There are not a lot of complicated metaphors or elaborate language. Johnson was inspired by classical Roman forms and ideas that celebrated moderation, propriety, elegance, graciousness, and civility. And the poem On My First Son displays that Roman ethos of equanimity. That is, it displays a calmness and composure, an evenness of temper, uh, you know, especially or even given the uh, painful difficulty of the topic. The, the poem arguably expresses a stoic attitude even while the pain of the speaker is evident. And that poetic style, by the way, um, is actually very much in contrast to the way Ben Jonson lived his life. He, he was a larger than life figure, uh, a great lover of food and drink, and, and not always so good at moderating his passions and appetites. What is most notable about the poem's restraint, I would say, is that he never mentions the cause of his son's death. It's as though to mention the plague or pestilence, uh, it's, it's, it's as though to mention those things would, would destroy the possibility of stoic restraint. You know, as though the horror of the disease might disrupt and break through that polished surface of restraint in the poem and the break through the fragile calm of it. The poem can express death and death and, and the sorrow death brings, um, but perhaps to bring in the plague and pestilence would be to express horror. Um, and, and I don't think horror fits into the elegiac mode. There, there's no meditative sadness or, or possibility of consolation in horror. So not mentioning the death by plague is significant. And I, there are a lot of non-mentions in, in plague literature, a lot of things that aren't mentioned. And it's so it's significant here for what it allows Johnson's poem to do and what it keeps out of that poem. Oops. So I think what, one of the ways of addressing the unspeakable is not to speak it simply. And uh, we may all have individual personal experience of that, of simply finding it hard to say the words that describe something so horrible that we don't want to acknowledge it, as though saying it will make it real or it will force us to face it. But also the magnitude of certain events, genocides like the Holocaust, Holocaust, nuclear bombings like at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, terrorist attacks like 9-11, urban pandemics like the 1603 plague in London, these, these enormous horrible events which kill thousands or even millions in short periods of time and bring social order and psychic trauma these kinds of events are often said to quote Ernest Gilman, um, to exceed the limits of language. These events are so horrific and so extraordinary that sometimes it is said that regular everyday speech that's you know, grounded in ordinary experience and, and direct report cannot express them fully or accurately. You know, it's, it's that idea of words fail. You know, it's as though we don't want to allow what is horrible or hateful or deeply painful to have a place in our realm of ordinary language. And so we can somehow keep it out of ordinary life. Okay, uh, moving on to what is expressed in the poem. <clears throat> 
in Johnson's My First Son. One thing we definitely see in, in this poem is we see the language of sin and uh, we see the language of debts and account. And I've talked about this sort of discourse in plague, um, in plague discussion and talk in, in the previous lecture. So Johnson says, my sin was too much hope of the loved boy. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate, on the just day. So the boy was only lent to the father, and that's a standard Christian sentiment that God can call back his people on earth at any time that they're just alone and, and you know, Christians should not become too attached to the ephemeral things of the world, including the people, um, because they are merely lent for a time. So the boy is a debt in this sense that must be paid back when called for on the date that the debt is due to be repaid, that is on the just day. But this language of accounts and debts, what is owed and what must be paid, is also related to sin, which Johnson evokes when he seems to assume that he has sinned and is paying for that sin with the death of his son. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay exacted by thy fate on the just day. And we saw in earlier lectures uh, this week that the that preachers insisted that plague was a, a just punishment for sin. And we see that again here as the poet suggests that God carefully looking over the accounts has rightly and justly called in a debt a debt created by Johnson through his sinful behavior and to be paid off through the death of his son. But there's a fair bit of tension in these lines. Exacted and just are in tension with each other. Just asserts that God is just and right to take the poet's son but exacted, meaning demanded and obtained, has the strong implica implication of force and threat having been involved. When I say something has been exacted from me, I am suggesting my strong unwillingness to have given it over. Now, the words don't contradict each other. Something can be exacted justly, but they do create a tension by suggesting simmering below the surface feelings that are not in line with the overall restraint of the poem's tone and style and, 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 and are not fully in line with that resolutely Christian moral acceptance. that the payment was exacted from the poet suggests the possibility that the poet is resentful or angry or, or something other than simply sad about his loss, something other than fully resigned. So that leads us to the question, you know, the question of what sin, you know, for what sin is the son's exacted as punishment. And the poet says his sin was too much hope of thee, as though he's being punished for his excessive attachment uh, to the young boy and his hope for and pride in the future continuance of his patriarchal line and name. And there is Christian resonance to this sin uh, the sin of giving excessive regard to earthly possessions rather than focusing on the promises of salvation. And at least one preacher in a sermon after a bad plague year listed among the sinful human causes of the pestilence, 
that parents have, quote, gloried in the number of their children and set too much their hearts upon them. Frankly, I see this, I, I think this reads as preachers finding justification after the fact to rationalize the death of innocent children. And it, it is a rather cruel aspect of plague theodicy to blame parents for the death of their own children through suggesting that they loved them too much. But this is the theodistic justification Johnson uses when he writes that his sin was too much hope of his loved boy. And then when he calls the day of Benjamin Jr.'s death the just day. I do wonder though, if we can read lines two to four as expressing a kind of restrained controlled anger and questioning or doubting the justice of the fate that's been exacted. I, I feel that we can perhaps see a, a quietly bitter anger um, operating here. And you know, at the irony um, that a form of love might be a sin. So this idea that the poet excessively valued his son is picked up in the poem, at the end of the poem, in the final two lines. And he says, for whose sake henceforth all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. So he says here, um, uh, for young Ben Johnson's sake, whom the poet names in the previous lines, the elder Ben Johnson will vow that in the future, whatever he loves, he won't love too much. Okay, so we'll unpack that in a moment. But just for the sake of clarity, I want to note that the his and the he in these lines is the poet referring to himself in the, in the third person. Okay, so what does he mean by as what he loves will never like too much? I think one way to look at this is to understand love here as the love of a parent for a child, the expected dutiful love that God in nature requires. Whereas like is perhaps the more personalized, individualized version of that love. So don't let your affections become too personal, too much about fulfilling your own pleasures and desires. Don't turn your proper and dutiful Christian love, which God requires, you know, to of all according to Christian doctrine, don't turn that into a source of personal gratification. So this is a very stern version of Christianity that takes the joy and pleasure out of even love between parent and child. And at any rate, it is certainly a difficult resolve to stick to, even if perhaps a smart one uh, to make during a plague year. And, and even, you know, child mortality rates were high in early modern period as it was. And earlier in the poem, if you'll remember, Johnson writes, oh, I could lose all father now, as though to suggest that he desires to cut away all thoughts of fatherhood, to, to cut away that part of himself that nurtures and loves as a father. And he didn't do that, of course. Uh, he had more children, although no, none survived to adulthood. And he also mentored younger a younger men as poets. But here, you know, we, we see the poet expressing desire to discipline himself, to discipline his passions in order to avoid the pain of loss. And by, you know, by avoiding intense emotional commitment and the kind and degree of love that brings pleasure to the self, uh, you know, if he could avoid that, he can avoid pain. Now, 
I, I do not think pleasure is necessarily, uh, to self is necessarily selfish. Um, but the anxiety the poet expresses here seems to be that the pleasure one takes in one's love, you know, in, in what one loves is, is selfish and prideful and smug and therefore sinful. That seems to be the logic here. You know, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I mean, what we know about Ben Jonson is that his work displays this enormously high degree of poetic discipline and skill, but he was not personally in his emotions, appetites, and behaviors a disciplined, moderate person. And he seems to have struggled with that, with, with that aspect of himself. Now there is a sin, a potential sin, if you want to look at it that way, that Johnson doesn't mention. And I think it's a significant oversight. And that's the sin of flight. Whether or not Johnson intended to evade an impending epidemic when he left London in the spring of 1603, he did leave his son and wife alone there uh, where they had to fend for themselves during that terrible summer. And we saw earlier uh, the centrality of the moral debate in plague literature around flight, uh, whether or not it was okay to leave the city during plague. You know, that was an issue that was debated um, by English religious commentators as, as well as non-religious commentators. It was also debated by the, uh, the great continental religious reformers as well, like Martin Luther and John Calvin. And whatever the subtleties of the debate, the overall consensus was that flight was always sinful on the part of magistrates, ministers, and the fathers of families, and that leaving the city by these uh, political, religious, and family leaders was a betrayal to their obligations to those under care. Now, there were all kinds of subtleties to that debate, which I think we got into last day, but it, it it was certainly frowned upon. Um, and as I said, it wasn't just the preachers and the religious ministers who took up that question. Uh, many of London's writers of the plague took the subject up as well, um, you know, and they talked about people leaving London during the plague. And I, I mentioned in the previous lecture, the playwright and pamphlet writer, Thomas Decker, who wrote several pamphlets about plague. And in his long poem, uh, News from Graves End, he specifically addresses the rulers of London and, and admonishes them, uh, reprimands them for abandoning their responsibilities. And I'm just gonna read that bit of the poem. Only methinks you do err in flying from your charge so far. So coward captains shrink away. So shepherds do their flocks betray. So soldiers and so lambs do perish. So you kill those you're bound to cherish. So you kill those you're bound to cherish. And those are pretty harsh words. And it's highly likely that Johnson was away from his family inadvertently, um, that he did not purposefully abandon them. But words like these ones might well have stung uh, under the circumstances. Okay, let's move on to talk about consolation. Elegiac poetry generally offers or um, meditates on what consolation is available in the face of loss. And the words that address consolation in Johnson's poem are in lines five through eight. And Johnson asks, for why will man lament the state he should envy? To have so soon scaped words, excuse me, to have so soon scaped worlds and flesh's rage, and if no other misery, yet age. I just want to quickly comment. Um, I'm not trying to make why and envy rhyme, 
but in early modern English diction, the pronunciation would bring them much closer together than uh, our modern North American pronunciation. Okay. Uh, yes, so Johnson says here that he should envy his, his son's death, not lament it. Um, you know, from a Christian position, that would be the appropriate response. He should rejoice for his dead son that he is in a better place, experiencing the eternal bliss of heaven with God. His son has escaped the world's and flesh's rage. He's, he's escaped the outrages and indignations of living in this world and, and specifically of living in the body, in a body, flesh's rage and growing old and experiencing the miseries of old age. Johnson certainly appears confident of his son's salvation in that, you know, he would have no reason to envy him if he did not, if he didn't actually seem to be, you know, uh, if he didn't believe that his son was not in heaven. But he doesn't seem to actually take a lot of consolation in the idea that his son is in a better place um, and that his soul is in a better state. I mean, he asks why he should lament because he is lamenting. Um, you know, he, he should feel happy for his son and envious of his son. Why should he lament? But he doesn't, he feels sorrow. In another epigram, uh, a very short one called Of Death, Johnson expresses the Christian position of comfort in death much more confidently and explicitly. He that fears death or mourns it in the just shows of the resurrection little trust. So what he says here very simply and clearly and briefly is that if one fears death or mourns the dead, that person is showing their doubts about salvation, either for themselves or for their deceased loved ones. There's nothing to fear or mourn if after death one resurrects in heaven for eternal life. One should not mourn that. In On My First Son, however, he seems to have trouble achieving that consolation. On the other hand, we can look at his poem about his daughter, Mary, and the consolation is much more apparent and it offers us a real contrast here. So in On My First Daughter, uh, there are roughly seven of the 12 lines that express the consolation offered by the idea that his daughter is in heaven. And I'm gonna read the uh, poem here. Here lies to each her parents, Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to rue. At six months end, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. Whose soul heaven's queen, whose name she bears in comfort of her mother's tears hath placed amongst her virgin train, where while that severed doth remain, this grave partakes the fleshly birth, which cover lightly gentle earth. Okay. So what he writes here is that Mary died so young at six months that she left the world with her innocence fully intact, uh, not having had a, a time to acquire the inevitable sins that humans acquire over a lifetime. And he, the father, rues or regrets less at her death than he might because he is confident that his baby daughter has been given, uh, been duly given heaven's gifts. You know, the, the, the gifts that she deserves to get from heaven, being heaven's due. That is, you know, he describes what these gifts are, you know, what, what due heaven paid his daughter and owes 
his daughter because she was so innocent. And what those gifts are is that his daughter's soul has been placed by heaven's queen amongst the queen's train of virgin innocence. Okay. So that is, she has been chosen by Mary, who is the mother of God and heaven's queen, and for whom Johnson's daughter Mary was named, to be part of Mary's personal entourage, and that's a great honor. So the poet notes that this is a consolation to the infant Mary's mother. It is in comfort of her mother's tears. So this poem is all about comfort and consolation. The father has less to rue or regret and the mother is given comfort for her tears because of the knowledge that baby Mary is in heaven and is being honored there. Okay, let's move on and look at the poems about John Rowe. Uh, the poet's complicated response to to the death of his loved ones is also apparent in the epigrams of John Rowe, that friend who died of plague in his arms. In his first uh, poem to John Rowe, Epigram 27, um, offers some of the conventions of Christian consolation. So I'll read. In place of scutcheons that should deck thy hearse, take better ornaments, my tears and verse. If any sword could save from fates, rose could. If any muse outlive their spite, his can. If any tears could restore his wood. If any pious life e'er lifted man to heaven, his half. O oh, happy state, wherein we, sad for him, may glory and not sin. Note the final three lines. If any pious life e'er lifted man to heaven, his half. Oh, happy state wherein we sad for him may glory and not sin. He states quite clearly here that if Ever there was a pious life that led a man to heaven, into heaven, that was lived so well and with such fulfillment of religious duty, it was the life of John Rowe. So because that is the case, because he was so righteous in his life, those who are sad about his death can glory and be glad. Um, you know, and, and by glorying in, in Rowe's death and his ascension to heaven, which is the inevitable result of his uh, righteous life, the sad mourners avoid sin. In fact, it's sinful not to glory in this. So, it, you know, as I've said, it was a fairly dominant religious belief, particularly a Protestant religious belief, that it was sinful to mourn excessively uh, when you were certain of the salvation of the deceased. And that mourning excessively suggested that you weren't certain of their salvation. Okay, hey, well, Johnson's second epigram on Sir John Rowe is considerably more ambivalent, however, in, in the emotions it expresses. What two brave perils of the private sword could not effect, nor all the furies do, that self-divided Belgia did afford. What not the envy of the seas reached to, the cold of Moscow and the fat Irish air, his often change of clime, though not of mind, what could not work. At home, in his repair, was his blessed fate, but our hard lot to find, which shows wherever death does please to appear, seas, sirens, swords, shot, sickness, all are there. So within this admittedly very convoluted syntax, which is somewhat unlike Johnson, um, there is no mention of heaven or Christian consolation. Uh, rather, the primary theme here is the arbitrariness of death. 
And John Rowe was a soldier who survived combat, shipwreck, and multiple other hazards and perils due to his, his military life. And yet, it was when he was at home, when he came home to rest to repair, it was after his exceptional military service, it, it was then that death caught him. And, and the poem seems to suggest that it seems to express the sneakiness of death. It's, it's willful unpredictability. You know, death seems almost spiteful here. You know, Roe gave great service as a soldier. He risked his life valiantly multiple times, but just when he came home to rest and enjoy the rewards of a life well lived, and instead of dying as a hero in action, he dies unheroically at home of this dreadful, loathsome plague. So the, the poem ends not by affirming Rose's afterlife in heaven or the heroic life he led while alive, but with a meditation on the annihiling, uh, the, sorry, on the annihilating force of death. Rose's death shows that wherever death does please to appear, seas, sirens, swords, shot, sickness, all are there. That's how he ends. He ends, you know, by pointing out how death has a capacious and wide ranging competence. And it has many modes in which it can appear. It comes by sea, it comes by sword, it comes by gunshot, and it comes by sickness. And you'll note the poetic devices that, that Johnson uses here. He uses alliteration, um, the way he repeats the S sound in the last line and a half, although in fact, it, it even shows up earlier in, in the line nine with shows. Uh, and that alliteration, the repetition of sound, repetition creates emphasis. And the repetition of certain sounds uh, creates certain meanings. So that alliterative S, it, it, it's the sound suggests a snake-like quality implying slyness and danger. And that last line simply hisses and, and, and slithers wherever death doth please to appear, seared, seeds, sirens, swords, shot, sickness, all are there. So there's no comfort at the end of this poem or, or anywhere in the poem. It's just a disturbing list of the noxious ways in which death does its work, you know, and, and the arbitrariness of death. So these epigrams about death, you know, um, including the ones about the plague deaths of Johnson's son and his friend, they, they express a certain amount of religious conflict you know, on the one hand, uh, Johnson stoically expresses guilt and a sense of his own sin. And he also expresses Christian consolation offered by salvation in heaven. But there's also a certain bitterness um, expressed uh, over, over what appears to be the cruel and arbitrary operations of death. And there's also this quiet anger or restrained bitterness that is not fully reconciled by Christian consolation and faith in God's justice. Thank you.